Go ahead, please. Thank you, Hervé Mariton, former French MP. Uh, one quick question, mainly uh, to Michael. Uh, you didn't uh, talk much about NATO, so if you were to have a stronger position of Europe uh, on defense, uh, what does it mean uh, as the uh, evolution of NATO goes? That could also be addressed to Bogdan. Quick question to Richard and Stephen. Uh, you're very enthusiastic about Europe. Nonetheless, the Brits voted for Brexit. The last popular vote in France was a no vote in 2005. I voted yes, but the majority voted no. Many in Eastern Europe actually criticized the way Europe goes. Would you, each of you, make one proposal of uh, concrete evolution in the way Europe could work? All right, thank you. Can you pass on the mic uh, to the lady behind you? Thank you. And then moving it. Ma question est pour Madame Guigou. Vous avez parlé que l'Europe doit être plus impliquée dans les affaires du monde et vous avez parlé du, de, la politique, de, de la politique envers l'Afrique. Que pensez-vous l'Europe doit faire avec la crise au Moyen-Orient, précisément envers la Syrie en vue que le flux de réfugiés s'abat sur l'Europe. Uh, I have a small comment also to Mr. Lothian. You said about the Shia Sunni divide, this is something I've researched thoroughly. I don't think not to have a, a open to both sides, I don't think the West should get involved at all. This is something the Muslim ulama, the centers of Islam, like Azhar and Najaf, should reconcile among each other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the gentleman here in the second uh, row, please. I'm Chol Gijiu, former ambassador to Morocco, France, and former senior advisor to Korean president. Uh, in 1995, we launched the Asia-Europe summit process. Uh, we, did, uh, we did it with the belief that uh, it might uh, contribute to making the world better. It was done through initiative of President Chirac and uh, Prime Minister Ko Chok Tung of Singapore. And uh, then a uh, biennial summit meeting um, is con uh, continually held. Uh, but uh, even though we have the pillar of discussion on the value, I, I, I wonder whether the process, the existing platform is properly used in times of crisis like this, where we should you know, discuss the refugee issue, North Korea nuclear, you know, many others, we have to discuss. But uh, some in level sometimes good for meetings of leaders, but uh, seem a little bit, little bit lackluster in terms of producing concrete results and exchange of ideas. So maybe intellectuals can join in that process. I hope very much that uh, in the uh, ASEAN process now we have uh, India and Pakistan beyond uh, China and Japan and Korea and ASEAN, of course. So we'd better valorize and use this existing platform to discuss common challenges. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's take in a couple of more questions. You have the microphone. I haven't forgotten you in the last row. Merci, je vais parler en français. Et pour Elisabeth Guigou, euh, j'ai retenu une idée intéressante, c'est que l'Union européenne s'est définie par rapport à ses frontières. Euh, Est-ce que ceci n'a pas amené l'Union européenne, de temps en temps, à tourner le dos à la Méditerranée et donc à faire perdre aussi à la Méditerranée sa centralité nécessaire Uh, certes, il uh, y a une, cette belle conclusion, Afrique-Europe, mais est-ce que actuellement, avec le retour de la croissance, avec uh, les discours Macron, avec uh, les initiatives peut-être de Merkel, ça n'est pas le moment de se réconcilier avec une frontière, parce que tourner le dos à la Méditerranée, d'après moi, ça a été avant tout aussi au détriment de l'Europe. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, gentlemen. My name is Stan Cozon, Capgemini. A question uh, regarding immigration. Uh, Richard Burt told us that EU should define a strategy for migration and immigration. Question to the panel. What is the likelihood that within a year, let's say when we meet for the 11th edition of this World Policy Conference, this strategy has been defined, number one, and second, its execution has started effectively? All right, thank you so much. Uh, last question, the floor is yours. Daniel Dayan of the Central Bank of Romania. Two questions. First one to Michael Lottian. When you say that uh, the UN, the governments of the UN should, should change because it's, it reflects it's a leg there is a legacy problem. More clearly, what do you have in mind, basically? Okay. Secondly, Merkel Macron, okay, the key tandem but what is the critical mass 
in terms of visions, we should help the union redeem itself and, and move forward. Because they, they may not be kindred spirits when it comes to very concrete steps. Thank you so much. Now, wide variety of questions to uh, uh, many of you. Uh, Richard, uh, some of you were addressed to you uh, personally. Also take this as an advantage for final remarks uh, as we go through the row uh, and then wrap this session up. Richard. Well, I, I'll make a, just a couple of quick comments. First of all, I detect in, in many of the questions uh, the kind of persistence of what I would call Euro-pessimism. Now, if we were here a year ago, we would all be wringing our hands about the threat of populism. We'd be worried about, uh, about uh, Marie Le Pen in France. We'd be worried about what was uh, the AFD in Germany. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Bill Drozdiak, has, wrote a book that's just been published. Unfortunately, wrote it six months ago. It, it was called Fractured Continent. People aren't talking really anymore about a truly fractured continent. We know about Brexit, we know about Catalonia, but uh, I think there is a new optimism, and I think the optimism does go directly to Merkel on the one hand and Macron on the other, and there will have to be a grand bargain there. As far as I understand Emmanuel Macron, he is laying out in a kind of brilliant, exciting way, a kind of Kennedy-esque way, a vision for Europe. And it's a, it's a vision based on putting a Europe, Europe first. And it's also a vision based on finding a way to reform and, and, and strengthen European EU institutions, including the, the European monetary system. The big question for a long time has been, is, are the Germans ready to come in, be brought along? Are the Germans prepared to make the necessary financial concessions to make Europe work? Now, the Germans will never agree on a transfer union, but Merkel in the campaign made some comments and has said that I think that there is a new willingness to think about reforms, uh, particularly of the monetary system, of creating what, what Europe, in my judgment, genuinely needs, which is a common fiscal strategy. And maybe the fact that Wolfgang Schäuble will not be the finance minister in the next German government means that there may be some more flexibility there. So I'm fundamentally optimistic about reinventing this, this German, French-German axis within Europe, the motor that's important or necessary to make, uh, to make Europe work. There was, uh, last comment, there's this question about, gee, can you come up with one idea for changing Europe? And my, I, I think I mentioned it. I do, I do think that uh, immigration is a, is, has, has already been demonstrated to be a serious danger to, uh, to European unity. And we saw that in very stark terms, in terms of how different nations, and I have to say the nations of Central Europe responded to the problems of immigration. I think historically it's understandable. These were countries that weren't as cosmopolitan, if you will, as, uh, as Western European countries. They were under, uh, under Soviet domination. Uh, they, they, they didn't have the, uh, the experience and the openness that uh, Western European countries had, and they responded, uh, uh, they responded uh, in a predictable way. But I think if a European-wide approach, an EU-wide approach, not a national approach, if it can be worked out, is necessary because another crisis in the Middle East, a crisis in North Africa, could just re, could reemerge and create the new set of strains that would be very counterproductive to what I see as the very positive trends that are alive, alive and well in Europe today. Thank, thank you, Richard, uh, for your assessment. And uh, interestingly enough, of course, pointing out German leadership uh, Germany's role in uh, moving forward, uh, 
this is a panel, not too many people, not too many panels these days on the future of Europe without a German on the panel, but uh, uh, we have, well, I'm the moderator, I'm the moderator, so, you know, we have six panelists as is, I won't chime in here, but uh, I know that German leadership, I think, is talked about much more outside of Germany than it is within Germany, interestingly enough, but except, Steve. Except, let's call it Franco-German leadership. There right? you go. I'm sure Elizabeth would have corrected me uh, by the time uh, it's her turn. But first, Steve, uh, uh, you may not be German, but of course you're a German expert. Uh, there, there were a couple of questions I think that uh, you, you are very uh, astute to address. Okay. I'll be quick about this. I mean, certainly the existential panic that led to the Bratislava summit has calmed down. There's no question. And at least the European Commission is willing to take more political risk. Whether it, you know, they can come to a common asylum policy, I doubt, partly because it's such a matter of um, national issues. But three, not just one proposal, three proposals, <laughs> very quick proposals. One, the problem isn't immigration, qua immigration, the problem is loss of control. The problem is the sense of uncontrolled immigration, and there is now more Ordnung, there's more order to it, even in Germany, I think that issue's calming down. The problem in Central Europe is being told what to do by Brussels on this issue or other issues. So, three, one, frontier. Schengen has to have external frontiers that work, otherwise it doesn't work. Frontex actually, which has a new name that I forget, is getting a lot more money, um, it, and it is doing more. I think that's really important. Second, Greek debt has to be forgiven, at least big chunks of it. The Germans are going to have to swallow that down. It's just, it's unsustainable. It's ridiculous. You can't have a, a, a stable Europe, a stable euro otherwise. And three, my other suggestion is that council meetings of country leaders should begin with breakfast and not with dinner. It would make a tremendous difference, I think, to the quality of the decision making. Um, on Merkel, Macron, I mean, I, I respect quelle audace for Macron. What audacity, quite extraordinary. I think his speech was very good, but a little too early because the Germans hadn't yet figured out a government, and I think he should have done more coordination, not just with Madame Merkel, but with the countries of Central Europe too, who rather resented the speech um, because they felt left out of it. Um, and, you know, we'll see. I mean, I've just looked at a bunch of um, poll figures done by the Kurber Foundation from Germany, and um, we want a lot from Germany. I'm not sure Germans want to give us what we want. I mean, they, yes, they like more European defense, but they don't want to spend any money for it. They will not, I mean, half of Germans will think they should not come to the aid of a NATO member if it were attacked by Russia. Half, that's Article 5. And yet, 85% of Germans believe the US will come to their aid if necessary. So there's an ambivalence and a schizophrenia which is historical and lasting and has not yet been resolved. Th thank you, Steve. And we will, of course, uh, continue to look forward to your astute observations in the New York Times about the current state and future state of uh, the EU. Now, Elizabeth, there were a couple of questions directed to you personally, so please go ahead. Oui, merci. D'abord, Macron. Thank you. At the outset, Macron. Macron. That of course could give strong impetus. Parce que Macron a décidé de faire des réformes et que l'Allemagne presse la France de faire ses réformes internes depuis longtemps. Et la deuxième chose, c'est que pour la première fois, me semble-t-il, depuis la chute du mur de Berlin, l'Allemagne a besoin de la France. Elle a besoin de la France. 
justement pour ces questions de sécurité, de terrorisme et euh, aussi de maîtriser ensemble les mouvements de population. Euh, je raison. Le problème, ce n'est pas que ça existe, parce qu'on en a besoin en plus de l'immigration. L'Allemagne est, est dans un déclin démographique terrible, bien plus encore que les autres pays européens. Le problème, c'est l'organisation de l'immigration. Et vous avez raison, le devoir d'accueillir les réfugiés. C'est un, un devoir euh, non seulement moral, mais c'est un devoir du droit international. Donc on doit poser cette question euh, entre Européens. Donc ça veut dire que, bien sûr, il faut que l'Union européenne continue à se renforcer, euh, mais euh, vraiment, à ce, on ne peut pas tout faire au niveau de l'Union européenne. Il euh, y a beaucoup de choses, énormément de choses qui doivent être de la responsabilité des États-nations membres de l'Union européenne. Ce que l'Union européenne doit faire, c'est d'aider les Européens à affronter davantage les défis globaux. Dans un monde global, il y a des défis globaux qui ne peuvent pas être relevés simplement isolément. Alors, à partir de là, la question de la sécurité est évidemment centrale. Et il, y a, il faut que nous nous arrivions, on n'a pas le temps aujourd'hui, mais enfin, il faut approfondir un peu les choses, parce que euh, Trump nous rend service en disant euh, « Prenez vos responsabilités ». C'est vrai, mais ça n'est pas demain matin que l'Union européenne va pouvoir en remplacer euh, le parapluie américain et l'article 5, et la garantie de l'article 5. C'est complètement irréaliste. Donc, il faut sans doute recentrer l'Alliance Atlantique sur sa vocation initiale, qui est de protéger The le continent européen et pas d'aller s'éparpiller partout et en revanche, comme l'a dit très bien Bogdan, de donner, de faire en sorte que l'Union européenne puisse assumer mieux euh, la, 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 la sécurité à la fois avec son voisinage. Alors, nous savons très bien qu'il n'y a, a jamais de solution militaire, que les interventions extérieures finissent toujours par provoquer des réactions négatives, voire de futurs conflits, on l'a vu avec l'Irak. Donc, il faut évidemment des battle groups. Hein, Ce n'est pas ça qui va défendre la Pologne contre la Russie, si jamais il y avait une, une, des battle groups qui sont faits pour... Donc, nous avons besoin vraiment d'approfondir cette question-là, c'est-à-dire entre Européens, d'abord, d'avoir une vraie industrie d'armement européenne. Si on n'a pas d'industrie d'armement, ce même pas la peine de penser. Et puis d'avoir une stratégie commune. Alors maintenant, je viens à l'immigration, parce que c'est vrai que c'est un, un énorme souci. La, la non-maîtrise. La, la non D'abord, pour moi, même si dans l'urgence, il faut évidemment euh, renforcer nos frontières, D'ailleurs, c'était prévu dès le départ et on ne l'a pas fait. And, uh, Comme pour l'euro, il était prévu qu'on fasse une union économique, on ne l'a pas like fait. Euro, Donc, we il faut enfin faire ce qu'on aurait dû faire economy, depuis maintenant une vingtaine d'années. So Mais à ces solutions urgentes, ne répondront pas. Je veux dire, quand des gens now, risquent now, leur vie pour traverser so la Méditerranée, people, uh, ils passeront de toute façon. Donc, il faut le développer. C'est des solutions à moyen terme. Je ne vois pas comment... Nous pouvons résoudre cette question-là euh, sans, comme le disait très très bien Fatala Wallalou, si nous continuons à considérer que la Méditerranée est une frontière. La Méditerranée doit être un, un, un pivot pour organiser une coopération, un partenariat entre l'Europe et l'Afrique et le Moyen-Orient. Je, je ne... Parce que la Méditerranée, c'est le Maghreb, mais c'est aussi... Alors, je, je, je crois que nous ne nous en sortirons pas autrement. C'est la raison pour laquelle il me semble que notre principal objectif doit être d'avoir une vision pour l'organisation du continent européen dans ce monde éclaté qui est devenu encore plus incertain avec Donald Trump et l'organisation du continent européen. On n'a pas beaucoup parlé de la Russie, on aurait dû, enfin, on n'a plus le temps, mais l'organisation de ce continent il se tournait davantage vers le sud. Franchement, c'est là. L'Europe a réussi quand elle a trouvé des réponses aux peurs au lendemain de la guerre. Aujourd'hui, l'Europe doit trouver des réponses ensemble du moment qui sont liés à la globalisation. Thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Now, uh, they are telling me in 
uh, no diplomatic terms that the session is over. Uh, but, uh, and I know that uh, Yokio Okamoto, you have to catch a flight. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead? It's, uh, we won't uh, hold it against you. Uh, we don't want, to miss, uh, want you to miss your flight. And uh, Bogdan and Michael, if I could ask you to be very, very brief uh, so uh, we, can, we can wrap uh, up the session. Yes, go ahead, please. Ju ju just one word before I leave. Uh, uh, you, uh, EU has been always regarded by Asians, especially by Japan, as a, an anchor of uh, conscience and stability. And uh, it's so sorry to see Britain leave. All right. <laughs> now, that's what I call a graceful exit. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Okamoto. Have a safe flight back thank to you. Tokyo. Michael and Bogdan, yeah. let, let's be brief. Three very short uh, answers to three very succinct, succinct questions. First of all, NATO. I didn't talk about NATO because NATO dilutes the argument about European security. First of all, if America is not part of NATO, there is no NATO. And so we're looking at something, a different animal. Secondly, the last time that NATO Article 5 was invoked was in relation to self-defense in relation to 9-11 in Afghanistan, out of area. And we, we begin to dilute the argument about European security when we bring NATO in. Second, Shia Sunni. I agree, it'd be much easier not to take sides. But the Sunni Arti, they do have the backing of a majority of the West. And the Shia feel very strongly about that. And I think we have a role in Europe where we could rebalance that slightly and give a certain reassurance which would be useful. Thirdly, the United Nations. I could write a book about this, so I'm not going to deal with it at length. But basically, we have a system in the United Nations Security Council where one permanent member can say no, and that becomes the world order. And we need to get to a situation where there's a better judgment of what is in the world's interest rather than the interest of one nation, and we need to be able to get there. Just one final comment. Uh, I keep on hearing everybody's reassured this year because after last year's concerns about the advance of the far right, it didn't happen. I wasn't here last year, and maybe I didn't get that feeling. But what I must say is this. From Britain's perspective, watching, what was it, 25% of the French voting for Marie Le Pen, watching 20% or whatever it was in Germany voting for the far right, watching this movie across Europe, that is scary enough. That these countries are prepared to invest their electoral strength in movements like that. And I think we make a great mistake if we, if we become complacent about All right, it. Right, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Terry is waiting in the wings, and you know he can be very persistent. 60 seconds, Bogdan. 60 seconds, OK. <laughs> it's a, it's very good, uh, it was a very good question about, uh, about NATO. We haven't forgotten about, uh, about NATO. And uh, uh, this panel was about the uh, abilities of the European Union to react in the sphere of security. That's why we didn't talk about NATO. But uh, very briefly, I'm satisfied, you know, with uh, both the results of uh, Newport and uh, Warsaw Summit concerning uh, reinforcement of the eastern flank of the alliance. Yeah? Enhanced uh, uh, forward presence and tailored forward presence. These were good solutions, and they were and are still consequently implemented. So implementation of those uh, decisions is, uh, uh, goes, uh, goes, goes uh, in the right way. That's first. Secondly, there was a crucial decision of the Warsaw Summit, this declaration between the EU and NATO, signed together by uh, SecGen of NATO and uh, both uh, Juncker and Tusk uh, on behalf of the European Union, on the cooperation between, between those two entities. It is necessary to enhance cooperation between the EU and NATO in the sphere of security. Without that, we cannot speak about a better feeling of security in Europe. And thirdly, I have a feeling, you know, that uh, we should work within NATO on the strategy concerning the southern flank. Because the strategy concerning the eastern flank uh, during the summit in, uh, in Warsaw was presented in a in a very clear and visible way. But to protect uh, the protection of uh, the, the, the southern uh, border of, uh, of uh, Europe was not, it consisted only on some elements. We should work on comprehensive strategy within NATO, how to reinforce and to protect the southern uh, alliance uh, border. Right. Thank you.
Le ladies and gentlemen, surprisingly, we weren't able to address and solve all problems within 90 minutes of uh, the European Union, but I think we were able, this spectacular panel was able to give you a lot of food for thought, particularly after the Trump panel yesterday, building up on what was being said yesterday about the future of the, EU, uh, of the US, now focusing on the future of the EU. Thank you so much for your active participation, but particularly for the spectacular panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>